Welcome to another one of my amazing videos, which is Asking the Expert. So today we have Mr. Andy Bradley, um, who is in the Kindness Arena, and I'm going to get him to explain a little bit more about that, on, isn't this amazing, World Kindness Day. <laughs> yeah. It just happened to fall on us that it was World Kindness Day. So Andy, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure thing, Matt. Well, thanks so much for hosting, mate. It's really great to be here. So I've been really consciously thinking about compassion and kindness for <clears throat> 17 years. Started in 2003. We had a mental health crisis in our family. We both had to give up our jobs. The kids were six and ten. And I'd done a lot of work in sort of social care. I'd, I'd been lucky enough to work with folks with complex learning disabilities. And I was very passionate about being person-centered and family-centered. I was really passionate about that work. And I'd kind of built up a bit of a worry about care, really, and health care, mm -hmm. and found it all a bit kind of tick box and a bit mechanical. It's just like ticking the yeah. boxes. And a lot of my colleagues seemed quite burnt out and a bit flat. So um, that was part of what was driving me. So I set up this thing called Frameworks for Change in 2003. I sat bolt upright in bed one night. We were in the midst of this crisis. We'd had to move out of home. And I just had the words frameworks for change. That's kind of what you've always done. I'd always loved as a manager, because I got into managing care homes. I'd always loved kind of creating frameworks to yeah. enable people to change. So that was the first thing. And then I was like, okay, so what's the purpose of this whole thing? And what came to me was we need to close the compassion gap. There's this compassion gap, which I kept feeling in schools, in hospitals, in care homes, in businesses, on the street, in criminal justice, all of our systems, there's this compassion gap. So then I started saying, so, okay, what's my kind of, if you like, foundational purpose, like in a sentence? And it was, how can we close the compassion gap to make the world a kinder place? So that's what's been driving me that question for 17 years. And um, wow. I'm still a beginner. I'm right at the beginning of it. It's such a big subject. But it's been an incredible um, experience. I've met some astonishing human beings. I've met some amazing mm -hmm. non-human creatures along the way. Spent lots of time out in wild places trying to figure things out with cool people. And um, yeah, a couple of things along the way. I designed um, compassion circles. So they're mm -hmm. sort of scaling now. Um, Public Health Wales have adopted them. Um, the health system in Colorado, Boston, uh, NHS mm -hmm. England. NHS England now as well, which is very cool. Uh, so we could talk more about compassion circles, maybe. Mm. Also, you know, where we came into contact, Matt, through the Kinder Leads work. Hang on a second. I've got somebody trying to make me come through. It's all right. Um, the Kinder Leads work um, came out of the question, how would we know we were living in a compassionate city? Yes. And then um, some friends came together and that led to a festival of compassion, kindness and well-being kinder leads the leads kindness revolution so um and in 2012 it's probably worth me saying that i gave a ted talk so if people are interested it's only 10 minutes it's called closing the compassion gap yeah um it's amazing i watched it the in, other day oh nice one thank mm. you thank you in brighton it's very much about well i won't give it away, I won't give it away. <laughs> we'll uh, drop the link kind of, below the video we'll, we'll, we'll link nice it so one. people can watch it and then in 2012, in a really surprising development, I was nominated as one of Britain's most radical thinkers by the Observer newspaper. Well, by several people, the Observer newspaper mm. were running this thing called 50 New Radicals, which was about finding people with ideas that could fix broken Britain. And three people very kindly nominated me for that. And then wow. the BBC got really interested in this kind of notion of 50 most radical thinkers. They narrowed it down to 10 and then to three and then to one. And it was me that they followed me around. They followed me around for a little while. So there's some wow. clips online from that time. A lovely, lovely journalist, Charlotte Ashton, got really interested in the seminars that we were doing in the NHS about compassion yeah. and kindness. Because a lot of people say, well, shouldn't be nurse, shouldn't nurses be kind anyway? But um, the systems tend to squeeze our natural energies and our most humane qualities out of us. So, yes, um, they have a yeah. tendency to do that, especially when things are a business and... It's not that it's always run as a business, but when something gets so big, what I've found mm -hmm. is it kind of waters down the abilities for those frontline, the nurses, the doctors to actually be, you know, as compassionate as they actually want to be. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes, you know, from, from my experience as well, just on that point, it's 
you haven't got maybe especially nowadays you haven't got one person looking after one or two patients you've got mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. lots of people looking after lots of people so there's a lack of continuity there isn't there yeah, and of course, with the context we've got right now, Matt, with the yeah. pandemic, there's a lot of reteaming. There's a lot of people rapidly having to upskill and change yeah. and adapt. And actually, what I'm noticing and feeling really inspired by and optimistic about is a lot of the sort of there's a lot of tribalism in medicine. So the doctors are very separate to the nurses, the nurses yeah. are very separate to the healthcare assistants, yeah. psychologists, etc. And a lot of that has just melted away. It's been really moving. Some of the teams oh, of people that I've been working with are just really finding each other as people because they need each other as people. So it's an incredibly distressing time for many many people mm. right now this pandemic but there are grounds for optimism in terms of what we're learning about the human condition because we are actually wired to cooperate we're not wired to compete yeah, um, absolutely yeah yeah we are and i suppose that nods back to you know history and we look at we look at tribes and that tribe mentality and the very very basic feelings of being safe being valued mm -hmm. and you know and being alive and actually you lose you lose one of those and things can yeah. really feel difficult, can't they? Yeah, so kind of building on that, Matt, I think, you know, we'll do anything to belong, won't we? Mm -hmm. You know, that sense of belonging in the tribe. Yeah. And I think in the modern world with the digital kind of revolution, there's a lot of um, false belonging. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing this, obviously, you know, with some of the biggest themes around Brexit, what's happening today with the sort of, Cummings and Boris Johnson's story, everything falling apart at Westminster. You know, the vote leave people are basically running our government, which is an extraordinary reality if you think about it. Yeah. And then obviously we've got Biden and Trump and these, you know, huge kind of waves and themes that are happening around the world. We're noticing something very powerful about the way some women lead, like Jacinda Aldern in New Zealand and Angela mm -hmm. Merkel, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, all much more open, transparent, communicating very differently. Yeah with their societies and their populations, whereas generally speaking, a lot of the male leaders tend to be defensive and talk about money all the time, how much money they've put in. So that there's something about divisiveness and populism that's going on at the moment. And if you add that in with, you know, the echo chambers on social media, a lot of people are in a lot of trouble psychologically because they're not actually finding true belonging. There's all this false belonging. So false belonging for false False belonging is about making other people wrong, basically. Yeah. And that's a big problem because it then we then lose our capacity for connection and we become unkind um, through that false belonging. Yeah. No, I definitely would, would agree with that. It's a very it's a very strange time, but it has brought a lot of things almost, <laughs> for want of other words, out of the woodwork. And it's really magnifying some of the decisions people are making and some and some mm -hmm. of the almost like fields they fit in as well. But emotionally it's that almost that anxiety what we're seeing is a heightened sense of like you said belonging but there's almost like in terms of there's no necessarily we don't need to go into deep in this but we're talking about this vaccine and then you've also you've almost all of a sudden got a camp that i'm not getting that because of this so you're getting your extreme views that's right people sitting in those camps and there's that's almost right. a feeling that actually if you're not sat in any of them camps mm. you ought to be Mm. And that's a, and that's a really interesting. I mean that you know hit, that hits me quite personally as well because I always like to think, well, I want to just go by the evidence. I want to go by mm. the facts and make my own decision. Um, but I suppose, like anything, when something gets emotional, people go back to that fight or flight response, and some people fight. But social media makes it really easy to say things you wouldn't say a bit to people's face. You wouldn't say in an actual communication environment, would you? Incredible, isn't it? You know this whole mm. cancel culture and. You know, there's something, there's something very, um, very, very, in a way, it's more dangerous than the pandemic, which is the danger of us becoming so far apart, we can never reconnect. Mm. You know, it's that deep, I think. You know, your body language there was extreme, you know, and, and, and we really are finding ourselves, many of us, poles apart. Mm -hmm. So maybe kindness is like the third way or something. It's like kind of um it's 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 another it's it's an encampment but it's not a camp or something there's campfires and people can come in from each end and mm -hmm. meet each other around the campfire and you know like the compassion circles are all yeah. about yeah. creating a safe space so that we can actually see feel and hear each other and it is literally 
it's about that oxytocin. So, you know, we're overproducing yeah. adrenaline and cortisol, which is making a lot of us overwhelmed and stressed, mm -hmm. building up mental difficulty. We're losing connection with our bodies and the need to move our bodies. We're not spending enough time in nature. These are the kind of big picture themes. Mm. So what we need is to release more oxytocin to balance our uh, balance our nervous system, to regulate our emotion. We need to release more oxytocin. And we don't really get to do that online i mean there are ways that you could do it online but we've got to connect with each other and you know we're in we're in a lockdown so go out for a walk with one person yeah. and uh, we can still go and knock on a neighbor's door take a couple of steps back and then just say how you doing just wanted to check in we haven't actually met before but i'm just wondering how you find in lockdown so we've been doing a fair amount of that kind of thing in kington where i live with yellow jackets on so people get to know that the yellow jackets are kind of yeah. safe and that we're very yeah. conscious of the pandemic etc because yeah. yeah. i think there's been a there's been a bit of a myth i don't mean to be cynical but i think i kind of call it the facebook gap mm -hmm. there's all these kind of facebook assistance groups and whatsapp groups that kind of sprung up in the first lockdown and they're all and there's a lot of us that kind of feel like we're being kind because we're liking comments or joining facebook threads i don't, I don't i hope that's okay to say i mean how does, that, yeah. how does that land with you but we're not really on our feet actually in each other's lives yeah it's yeah i think like i said with things you would you wouldn't normally say in person i also think that links to behaviors as well and actually there's that like you said there's that almost false sense of it's not a false sense of security but when it becomes about a lockdown and actually that lack of face-to-face -face communication you're right i think just joining so we had in micklefield where i used to live in the first lockdown we had um we set up a care group so that was to give out some food supplies to some of the most vulnerable in the community um and you would get a lot of people that that were liking and, and you know getting involved in all these posts online um but they're not actually getting involved, you know, in person. And there is a very different, there's a stark difference. And I think not to say that one of them has absolutely no value because I think the thought process can then, you know, their input for say people that are still working, people that were frontline mm -hmm. workers that could only get involved online could then yeah. start a conversation which would then lead to action. But I think yeah. it's, it's that false belief that for people that really want to do something, that that is the answer. Yeah. So yes. I think that's that's maybe where it's missed. Um, and I don't think yeah. it's cynical at all because it is yeah. everything's so high access and so convenient mm. now mm. for us to get everything 24 seven, everything's mm. so switched on that actually it's like firing a machine gun at a pin. Yeah. You're just getting everything, but very, very, very little will actually hit the spot and, and yeah. you know, and, and be efficient. Um, yeah. And I think if you're like, if you're watching this, uh conversation and and you know what we're saying here is resonating don't feel bad about it you know no. it, and if you feel like oh shit that's me he's talking about <laughs> me it's a it's a really big club team you know it's hard because we live in this digital world we've got so much so many kind of calls on our attention you know in a way this conversation is another call on our attention isn't it mm. if you're sitting here watching it you've chosen to watch a conversation about kindness so thank you for making that choice i hope no, you're finding absolutely. it useful but it's like for me um community activism is it, it, you know we have to be on our feet we, we have to literally we have to be on our feet and we have to leave our homes to be community activists and for me that's what kindness is all about really yeah, especially in a time we're in now. And just echoing what you've just said, then if you are watching this, what I really want to get across that we're saying is that if you have a burning desire and you have within you the desire to help other people, mm. and at the moment it's only online, but you've got the opportunity to be able to do something in person, mm. do something in person, get out there, get out into, into nature, see people in our natural habitat. And I think there's so much, there's so much more value to those communications as well. I know that me doing what I do as a, a fitness trainer slash coach, whatever, I immediately noticed that I missed the communication with my groups. So working with, working with older adults, working with you know, younger people, working with whoever, just that face to face and being out in an environment with somebody. Um, it's just so powerful. You just get so much from it. And, you know, there can be, you know, only one or two interactions or somebody could just make one comment and it can it can completely yeah. transform transform a day i mean we met 
so interestingly, just leading on to that, so we met in a, one of the kindness listening circles, um, mm-hmm. which I was introduced <laughs> by the Kindness Revolution and the Leeds Festival of Kindness, and then got involved in the circle. So I'm right in understanding that's very, very similar to the compassion circles you were talking about. It, it really is a compassion yeah. circle, that, okay. yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's... It, it's um, there's quite a few folks that are playing with the language. So some people call them care circles, other people kindness circles, kind listening circles, compassion circles, mm-hmm. um, listening spaces. But uh, it's all it's it, the, it's always kind of this sense of working with the circle, and there's always um, a deep listening going on, a curiosity and appreciation. Those are the kind of that's like the glue that holds the circle together. Mm. And there's always a host, and there's always somebody that's kind of running the show often called the facilitator so the host welcomes you in and is keeping you safe and then the facilitator is taking the group through these kind of quite conscious compassionate mm-hmm. kind practices i mean how have you found it matt have you been going regularly to the listening circles every week yeah wow. and then we've, we've actually changed one of the morning groups because there was a consistently a couple of us joining we're actually going to join on the monday night one so it's going to be a bigger and more consistent group and we're getting more deeper and deeper conversations and what's good is the facilitators and the hosts get involved just as much as everyone else does and i think everyone feels the benefit of it um yeah. it never yeah, feels it, forced it feels like a really open and warm environment to be able to say anything that comes to mind you're under no pressure to say anything deeper than you want to you know there's but what i would ask is if you could because i know there's a lot of people that and a big part of the reason why i wanted to do this video is there's a lot of people that struggle to or struggle to prioritize themselves because of many other factors, maybe too busy or they've got a yeah. busy family life, etc. Yeah. So a lot of the stuff we've just said, they may not have come across before. So if you were mm-hmm. to simplify what yeah. a compassion circle, kind listening circle, and again, I will link what Leeds Revolution are doing as well. So I'll link that on yeah. the video so you can have access to that. If you were to simplify yeah. it, how would you describe the experience of it? Um, so... <clears throat> It's an expression of two words, put most simply, and the two words are, you matter. Wow. And um, it's so easy in life to feel like you don't. It's so easy in life to play your part of mum, sister, daughter, worker, you know, all of life's a stage. We're all playing our parts in the drama, aren't we? But we can so lose connection with the self. Yeah. Just like, who am I? You know, because we we come into life, Matt, and then we, you know, we, we our family life is what it is. And for many of us, it's complicated and can be really difficult and even unsafe and traumatic, very sadly, for many of our human family. And then we basically spend our lives, most of us, trying to please the parent, please the teacher, then please the manager. <laughs> yeah. Right? And so we become kind of conformed, you know, we talk about conforming to certain social norms. It's almost like our whole sense of self and whole sense of being, it takes up a certain shape. And that shape can leave us feeling like we're continually pleasing or or, um, compromising Mm. rather than actually, I mean, there's loads of stuff out there on authenticity and all of that, but it's actually... Who, who are you? I mean, it's as fundamental as that, mm. you know, and, 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 and that's quite a deep question. And the reason that I'm passionate about the circle work, and I absolutely love Angela and Linda for holding the space so beautifully in Leeds. Mm. And so that a, a great man like yourself is finding that space and returning is because these are deep questions. It's not an overnight inquiry. This is not like, yeah. you're not going to, I'm not into all the kind of, you know, read a personal development book and away you go it's a deep thing you know if you've if you've kind of um spent your life pleasing adapting compromising trying to keep safe feeling hunted wounded you know Mm -hmm. then to actually feel into like who you are what your true shape is what you need just go gently with it because it's not an overnight jobby and actually it can be quite painful to even start thinking about it so go really gently approach it with real self reverence, you know, just saying, you know, I'm just going to say one cup of tea a day. I'm just going to really love myself while I make that cup of tea. Maybe the first cup of tea in the morning, 
I'm just going to go, do you know what? You're all right. You are, mate. You're all right. You do matter. Most of the day, you're going to feel like you don't because that's what you've been taught. Yeah. But you do. I do it in my porridge. <laughs> nice. So when, as I'm making my porridge, mm -hmm. I'm kind of touching into my suffering. Mm -hmm. Like it's a whole, it takes about 20 minutes to make it, you know, eat it, wash up the bowl. So it's become a bit of a ritual for me now. My, I call it my porridge practice, which might sound a bit weird. But well, um, no, as long I as just, it's porridge. I just feel into how am I doing right now and what yeah. do I need? Sometimes yeah. and I'll, I'll have a cry while I'm making the porridge or other times. And, and, and then it's kind of done then. I kind of wash up the bowl and then I'm mm. in the day, you know? And that's not saying I can't feel those feelings through the day, but yeah. I've been doing that for about a year now and it's really helped me a lot. So, you know, if you're watching this, then discover your porridge or your cup of tea. Yeah. You know, it might just be a little walk up and down the garden. Something yeah. where you touch into you know, really at a deeper, deeper level, who you are, what's your spirit, you know, mm. what's your, when, when you're, maybe think about a time when you've got really good energy and you were really happy and full of joy and you were like doing something that if you were a dog, it's like your tail is wagging. Yeah. Think about that kind of time. Think about what makes your tail wag and then just try and bring that into your heart. Even if you can't do that thing right now and then just try and, you know, cause basically being human is the coexistence of suffering and joy. You know, we don't, you know, no mud, no lotus, the Buddhists call it, don't they? Which is that, you know, we have to go through the shit to kind of get the blossoming, really. Yeah. And it's not either or. It's not either or. It's just that flow and that integration of suffering and joy. And it just keeps coming. It's like a figure of eight. Yeah. And it's, you know, there's so many people that I speak to day to day. And it is, it can be very, very difficult to sit and think actually about yourself because we're in a world of multitasking. So actually what you've just said there about making your porridge, about waiting for the kettle to boil, cooking tea, something like, you know, can be something like that. And that is yep. time that we are still being productive or doing the tasks that we want to do, but we fill it with somebody, something else. So what, what you're yeah. saying is yeah. fill it with something that's going to be about you and start yeah. discovering actually yeah. some of them feelings and yeah. um, and some of that value that, that you hold. Because I know from personal experience, when I started the, the listening circle, so this year has been a big one for me so the last four or five years have had a lot of things in them which has been very very difficult um okay. and i know this year has been the first time a lot of that's been stripped away and lockdown brought a massive period where the only thing i was left to think about was me so a lot of the things i'd put to one side because i was dealing with other stuff i'm now going through this room and there's all these boxes and I'm now having to sort them out mm. to then to then put them in the rightful place rather than just putting them somewhere to get to the next thing. Um, and that's really, really difficult. So again, if, you know, if it does hurt or, you know, you feel a little bit anxious or you feel a little bit upset when you start to think about yourself or things that make you happy or, you know, when you think about purpose, then that's absolutely normal. And that's actually, I always feel when there's almost when there's an emotional reaction like that attached to something, that's where, that's where you know you've got to dig a little bit further. That's where you know there's something behind that. Um, and it is, you know, it can be a long process. It's not the same for everybody. Some people will open up quite quickly and some people just won't. But every <clears throat> little bit, every, every extra moment each day that you can, you know, you can find value or purpose in yourself is... And has, there, has there been anybody, like you would say, that's kind of been like shoulder to shoulder with you, Matt, through that last five years? Um, I've got a few very close friends um, that, are, that are common throughout that. You see, my my personal coping mechanisms have been to keep quite solitary about it. Um, and their involvement would be when something physically happens or when there's some, a physical event that I might need support in or something, rather than just having a flow of conversation. But this year that has opened up. And that was difficult for me to actually open up because... Part of, I think part of the challenges were that I was in a role where I was very dependent on. Mm -hmm. So that had then caused me to give, to give myself the impression that if I then became that person, mm. that even, even asking for help would make me that person that was making me feel the way that I felt by the other person, if, 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 you, if you catch what I'm saying. So there was almost a fear of, 
well, if I ask for help, I'm then going to be, they're going to then feel what I feel right now in my situation, which, you know, which, which my logical head says that doesn't, that's not going to happen. But emotions can sometimes come in the way, can't they? And, and, you know, it can do wild so I don't, things. I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm meeting, I, I don't know. I, I, I have suffered in my life, Matt, with help, help I'm a helpaholic. Mm-hmm. Um, I avoid, I have spent much of my life avoiding my deeper self and my deeper feelings by finding people to help. Um, maybe a group so of people, maybe a group of people need to start up something like Helpaholics Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I really... <laughs> Would you need a sponsor thing, for that one as well? <laughs> it's, it's, so, it's so real, man. I mean, if you, you so so, I'll just talk from my own perspective. I thought I was being, generally speaking, kind to myself. I'd meditate. Mm. I was exercising, etc. You know, people. My mates would look at me and say, "Oh, you're on it, Andy. You're drinking your water, all that kind of stuff." You know, mm. you're meditating. You, you, you seem pretty chilled out. But I was absolutely avoiding myself, man. I was absolutely avoiding myself, and if I felt low. I would literally go out on the street and find a homeless person, ask them their story and just hang out with them and then wow. w- remain in their life. And I'm not saying that to like bring attention to myself. Yeah, I'm yeah, saying yeah, how, yeah. Dysfun- how yeah. dysfunctional I was okay. and to wow. a degree I still am because I was addicted to the state yeah. we would then enter because the person would say, oh, thanks so much. You're so kind. Nobody bothers yeah. to listen to my story. Yeah. And then the state that I'd get into was like the state. It's like a drug. It's literally yeah. like a drug. So yeah. I was kind of high on, you know, they talk about the helpers high. There is this notion of the helpers high. Well, it's, it's, it's the endorphins. It's, it's the, you know. It's a murky business. It's really, it's really dangerous. Uh, speaking from my own experience, it's mm. made me very, un, uh, very unwell. And then I get, and then there's a shame reaction, which might be, I don't know what you're speaking about there, Matt, because you do the helping. Then I go home and I go, oh shit, I've done it again. Is that ego? What is that? Why do I keep doing that? And then you start, mm. it's like, and then you kind of release yourself from that, go and find someone else to help. And so it goes on. So kindness yeah. is, um, kindness has, if kindness, if kindness does not involve the self, it's not kindness, it's pity. Yes. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to have to think, I'm a thinker <laughs> on that one. So I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll go away and think on that one. We'll talk again, mate, on that one. Yeah, yeah. I think there's, um, I've been doing some reading up on, I don't know if you've heard of a book called The Four Tendencies. Um, no. But it's the idea there's there's four different categories of people. There's, um, and without going into long depth, there's thing, the rebel on one side who um, isn't accountable to anyone, who mm-hmm. just makes up their own rules. Um, well, I fall into I fall into the obliger, so there's a test you can do, and it actually makes a lot of sense. Now, my accountability mm-hmm. is really high if it's for somebody else. Mm-hmm. If I'm doing something for somebody else, that automatically sticks it up there in the priority list and it gets done. But when it's for myself, yeah. which apparently, which I've read, there's a massive percentage of the population. When you're doing it for yourself, there's a lot less natural priority to that, okay. which then leads into positions that we're in um, where we need to promote being mm-hmm. kind to yourself. Which it's, cer- it's, it's certainly the case in my understanding, Matt, that that's true of the Western world. Mm. That, yes. that, yes. that yes. A- awareness of that. I think it's about 80%, some of the studies say, are much more comfortable doing stuff for others than they are for themselves. And then there's about 10, 15% that are kind of pretty cool with doing about the same amount for themselves as others. Then there's 5% that are narcissists, sociopaths or psychopaths. Who don't don't literally are not able to connect and engage with the needs of other people and it's very hard for those people to change and i think that the reason i make the point that it's the western world is because we do lack like foundational philosophies we don't we didn't develop buddhism we didn't develop confucianism or Taoism. that's we we borrowed them mm. and that you they came into america then they came over here so if you look at something like mindfulness meditation for example if you look at the movement in the us in the 60s and 70s that's when Zen Buddhism was really popularized in America. Mm-hmm. So we're babies at it. It's very new here. Of course. So yeah. we, we, we don't have a foundational philosophy. And what that means is a lot of us in the West, we're grasping for certain things. We'll do a workshop and wonder why three days later we don't feel better or we'll do some yoga and we'll, why am I not, you know, so, so that's why I remain very passionate about circle work. 
because as your experience is experiencing mm. there in Leeds, it's something that you can return to. So it kind of holds that, yeah. um, holds the wobble, if you like. It holds the yeah. wobble because you're never too far away from the next one. No, you're not. And yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Um, and it's almost a level of accountability as well because, you know, mm-hmm. you book onto it, you want to go. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of thing in, in things like habit training and, and positive habit mm-hmm. formation that... Mm-hmm especially around kind of mental health as well. If there's something that's important to you, because one of the tips I've given somebody before, if if there's something that's important to you, write it down, write down that it's important to you and that you've written it. And then actually when times when you're feeling a bit low, look at it, put it somewhere accessible. And it must be true if you've written it. So no matter how you feel at that point, you've once in consciousness written that. So actually there's, there's you know quite a link with that being helpful. I mean, yeah. what I was going to ask you based on kind of a mixture of things that we've been talking today yeah. is I get a massive feeling, and I thought this myself, and I'm sure a lot of people that are watching have, is the question. Mm-hmm. With us seeing everyone's life through social media, especially during lockdown, yeah. um, how can I justify... I say justify, but how can I prioritise doing things for me or working on me or valuing me when there are people that are worse off in this world? And we're not, and the thing is about now, we're not just talking about Ethiopia. We're not talking about third world countries. Mm. We could be talking about somebody around the corner who maybe on Facebook is saying that they're really struggling, you know, and sometimes you might not feel like you're struggling. So Mm. how can that person negate that? I just wanted to get you off. Yeah, great question, Matt. There are basically three kinds of business. There's my business, there's your business, and there's God's business. So take care of your own business. Resource yourself Mm -hmm. so that as and when you are needed in the moment, you are available to others, whether that be a friend or a family member or a neighbor or maybe there is somebody in that Facebook group that you haven't, you maybe not felt you've, you're resourced to connect with because you sense like a need there. Mm-hmm. And when you resource yourself, maybe you will connect with them. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, my, my realization stroke current theory of change is that it's be the change you wish to see, mate, isn't it? So yeah. if we want yeah. to make the world a kind of place, we have to make this world a kind of place. Yes. I have to make this world a kind of place. And, and I didn't, I've talked about this stuff for years without really understanding that in my body and in my soul. Yeah. And it's still work in progress, but I am, I'm, 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 I'm no longer taking baby steps. I'm taking more confident steps, more confident steps. In, in caring for myself. And I, I think, I think building on that, you know, we touched there on sort of habit formation. Just a really simple frame is after I will. So after the kettle boils, so this is just a little practice that I do. After the kettle boils, I will do 20 squats. Mm -hmm. After I go for a pee, I will do 15 press-ups. So the after I will, just maybe viewers might want to have a little think about that one. After I will. And and, and, um, Matt, remind me and remind us what you stand for on your t-shirt there. I do it for me. The video's going out in as well. I'm doing it for me. I'm doing it for me, right? So what habits are going to serve you? What habits are going to serve your your four energies, your body, your mind, your heart, and your spirit? And you can become really conscious of that. You can go, okay, so every day I'm going to do something for my body, something for my mind, something for my heart, which is maybe that porridge practice I was talking about, Mm -hmm. something for my spirit, a daily, you know, and just touch into those four things and you will be you'll feel more resourced it's inevitable and uh, you'll feel better about yourself and you'll and you'll still struggle because you're human of course of course (laughs) and do you know what i found is um and it was told to me as a theory and and being a a fairly i tend to think of myself as a logical person i like to test those theories Mm. and they do say that a lot of things are in, is infectious. So in, in terms of influence and how we influence people that we're close to and how we get their influence as well. So there's one notion that you are the combination of the closest five people to you. So that's who you yeah. become because your beliefs and that are, are all formed yeah. from that. But also in reverse, if you, for example, in this case, are kind to yourself, 
the people close to you will then see that you're being kind to yourself and you can have that reverse in, you know, you can have that impact on them too. So yeah. I know, and I just wanted to touch on, I know there's a lot of people that say that there's the struggle to find the time because of we've said before, you know, yeah. kids, family commitments and yeah. other things that they're providing and their role maybe put on this earth feels like to do everything for other people. Yeah. But what I would say is, and I've always said this all along is to do the best for them you need to be able to be the best you. Mm -hmm. So aiming for that will only make everyone else's experience of you even better. A, a, um, a friend of mine um, was telling me a story about re um, how full her life was. And she kind of talked me through her day with her work commitments. And one of her parents was very unwell and she had uh, three small children and she was mm. a single parent. And, and then so she was like comment, commenting on the day and then kind of at the end of the day, she's back the kids and she's an amazing mum. So she's, she's reading the seven-year-old a story mm -hmm. lying beside the seven-year-old in the bed. And she said, so I've just got no me time. So I just said, who is it that's reading the story? We often, you know, we often see, in fact, no, I'm going to rephrase that. We don't often see the opportunities that, that we think. So we need, there's a big thing for me. We need to be open. We need mm -hmm. to look into these things to see mm -hmm. the gems as, as and when we approach them. Um, they, they, they are literally ever present. Yeah. Literally. Kindness is never more than a breath away. Yeah. And control as well. Sometimes mm -hmm. there's a, an element of we can't control a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Like we can't control a pandemic, but we can control how safe we feel and how safe we make ourselves and the decisions we make in order to do that. Um, yeah, I, th I think kindness is about really surrendering yeah. and letting go of many notions of control, really. And just um, trusting, just allowing ourselves to just be in our day and allowing whatever is happening to be happening without resisting it. I think that's kindness mm -hmm. because it's happening. Trust and trusting our own judgment. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. And reaching out when we feel bewildered and confused, asking for help. Yeah. And I think that sometimes going with the gut and going with the heart necessarily more than just trusting the head. Yeah, totally. Because, so, because yeah, the head's totally. experience is, is normally built up by other other people's influence on us and our own conditioning and you know, all of our all of our thought forms are, are a result of our own the data streams that have been entering us yeah. since we were conceived so yeah. we don't have a lot of regulation of that one because all those thought forms are just going to yeah. keep coming so so um yeah the 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 invitation is to quiet your mind and open your heart as much yeah. as you can and, and the soles of the feet are really important just connect with the soles of your feet, move a little more slowly, quieten your mind, open your heart. That's, I think um, you'll be a kind, you, you, you will become a kinder place if you, even if you're in the shower or something, just go, oh, here I am, quiet mind, open heart, I'm having a shower. Yeah. The shower can be a very good place for thinking. I often find it is. That's the, if you ask, if you ask people where they have their best ideas, the, the, mm. the, the most popular answer is the shower. Mm. The second one is out on a walk. Yeah. And, and the third one is after two pints. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> we get very philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that, you know, that rounds off what I wanted to, to cover today. Right. Um, and I think the overwhelming thing for me and the very simplest thing I think anyone watching this can do, and it's something I still have to remind myself of, and, and I think mm -hmm. we're all still working at it. Nobody is an expert. No. Um, is actually to slow down. Totally. Slow down. Slow down and um, reframe and rethink the way we think about time. Because mm -hmm. the reality is there's always loads of time. <laughs> there's so much time available mm -hmm. in every day and every week. So the biggest tyranny in the modern world in the West is this falsehood that we're all too busy. I mean, if, if you want to just take a moment to think how many minutes are spent a day on Facebook and gaming, mm -hmm. it's extraordinary and, and how full we are of Netflix and taking data streams in. So I would say slow down, take more time and spend less time in front of a screen. Those would be my tips. 
<laughs> and life being made, life consists of moments. The past is past moments that have been and gone. And all that really matters and what is the moment that you're in now. So the more of those you can enjoy. Yeah. Do you know, I know, I know we're coming to the end, Matt, but do you know about Ram Das? No. So Ram Das wrote a seminal book. Um, it's called Be Here Now. And he's the only, uh, he was an adjunct Harvard professor of psychology that got into LSD in the 60s <laughs> and then uh, hung out with an okay. Indian gu guru and changed his name to Ram Das. So he's like, a lot of people have heard of Eckhart Tolle now. Yeah. The, yeah. the power of now. But Ram yeah. Das was like the Eckhart Tolle of his time. He died, he died recently. And um, so his, his, his direct instruction is, building what you were just saying, be here now. Yeah. And, and people would flock from around the world to see him speak. And he was a really funny guy. And they'd come and, and, and he, they'd all hang out on these hillsides. He'd be at the top of the hillside. Then he'd just start chuckling. And he said, I can't believe you've all come all this way to hear the instruction again. <laughs> be here now <laughs> and literally be here now <laughs> exactly yeah it's been great being with you mate i really appreciate what you're doing for us and i really appreciate what you've come through the last few years your dedication to yourself actually i mean what's pouring out of you is all this service to other people physically mentally emotionally uh, it was great hanging out with you in the listening circle mm. really good to connect and um Good on you, mate. And and I, I think you're really onto something very powerful with, with I'm doing it for me because you're kind of reframing what a lot of people think of as selfishness because ultimately yes. I'm doing it for me is very selfless yes. because when you do it for you, you're then a brighter light, aren't you? You can And then you can hold the torch for others. So good on you, mate. I really appreciate it. And thanks for inviting me in. And I, I, I'm not an expert on kindness, even though this is called As the Expert. I'm just trying to figure out how to be kind to myself. And um, yeah, a mate of mine calls it, try and be your own guru. Be your yeah. own guru on kindness. Yeah. Self-kindness. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming along today. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, we'll stick all the links below this video for the things we've said, your TED Talk and the other things that we've mentioned as well. Thanks uh, so much, man. See you later. Cheers, Matt.